Good evening. Thank you so much for coming and joining us for this event. Um, I am Dan, Daniel Rothbard, a faculty member for the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. Uh, we are live streaming on Facebook now, I'm told. Um, so thank you very much for being a part of this event. Um, You are welcome, of course, to um, enjoy the refreshments at any time. Feel free to, to just go back and forth uh, with that. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing the Dean of the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, uh, Dean Kevin Everick. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. There are a few things more joyful than launching a book into the world quite as heavy as launching a child into the world, but in some ways uh, similar. Uh, th these are really important topics, dignity and humiliation and the systemization of those things. Uh, a, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was in a, in a round table with two senior and esteemed scholars uh, in our field, and we were a answering questions from, from the audience about conflict d dynamics, root causes of conflict, and it struck me um, more than halfway through that most of the discourse, mine too to some extent, I was carried along by the stream, but most of the discourse was about incentives, it was about profit making, it was, it was about um, uh, conflict entrepreneurs. It was about corruption and blood diamonds and markets and, and all of that. And at some point, uh, even listening to myself caught up in the, in the flow, um, I said, well, okay, this, is, this has been all about greed. Where is the grievance? Certainly, when a conflict has been instantiated, when there's a conflict system, when it's been going on for a while, and there are conflict parties and subparties and factions, and particularly when there are outside malign actors somewhere, one can talk about the political economy of conflict. <clears throat> and one can talk the language of incentives. And one can talk the language of you know, rational choice decisions that some actors are making to make. Their, but there's another sense, particularly if one tries to understand the origins of a conflict rather than the persistence of it. Once the conflict system is really going and there are saddle points and, and all of those nodes and everything, then you begin to look at, I think, the original drivers. And the drivers by the masses more than by the ethnic conflict elites or the ethnic brokers. And what you end up doing then, I think, is to go back to some of the notions that really uh, were foundational for our field, <coughs> less so perhaps than in political science or in international relations. And these are things like basic human needs. These are things like identity. These are things like subjectivity. All of these things that I think bring us back to notions of humiliation <coughs> and dignity. And after that round table, I was reflecting upon uh, the beginnings of the uh, Arab Spring. And I mean the real beginning of the Arab Spring in Tunisia, that, uh, that, that, that fruit seller, flower seller, slapped on the face, and everything that followed from, from that. And thinking back to the signs, the placards in Tahrir Square. And um, you know, some of those placards, particularly the ones in English, said liberty and democracy. That's what we want. And that played very, very well, I think, on CNN, because it made it look like one kind of revolution that was part of a larger meta narrative of nation building and so on. But the signs in, 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 in Arabic, more often than not, did not say democracy, it said dignity. It said, Samuch, Sharaf, Karabat, 
right? All the, lots of words for dignity in Arabic, it turns out. And certainly at, at the beginning of that, what it became later, of course, is not the Arab Spring, but the Arab Winter, but at the beginning of that, it was about dignity. And I think that as much as we want to analyze existing conflict systems, and maybe even the persistence and the ramifications of conflict systems in terms of incentives and, the, and, and, and that kind of thinking, um, we shouldn't lose sight of the subjectivities of people getting slapped. You know, one can think about corruption in e e economistic terms and who profits and so forth. But ultimately, corruption, if you are trying to get a passport someplace, or get a visa, or get a license, or vote, <laughs> corruption affects people on the ground as affronts to their dignity. And not just as a way in which some kinds of elites profit. So in that vein, I want to welcome my, my colleagues, those who have come from, from afar and those who have come right down the hall. And I also want to uh, invoke the spirit of Evelyn Lindner, whose pioneering work at Columbia University in bringing the study of humiliation and therefore of dignity, the kind of remedy to humiliation, <laughs> into our field in a, in a strong way. So welcome to all of you Thank and you. welcome to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Averick. Um, by the way, there are so many people to thank for this project. This is a two-year project, basically, or maybe two and a half. And so many people who are obviously directly involved, as we're going to hear from my colleagues in this project, and so many people who um, were not only academic supporters, institutional supporters, but intellectual supporters. And Kevin Averick is obviously one of those for me um, on this project and so many others. So I'm very grateful for him. So um, we are obviously uh, having a panel discussion here. And I just want to say a few words to frame this project, kind of in a little and very briefly, a genealogy of this project. Um, and not a thousand page book, I'm not going to read that, uh, but a genealogy. And in a way, this project began uh, some years ago when my colleague, Karina Korostlina, and I we're looking at identity-based conflicts, and we noticed a, a kind of experience that marginalized people have for generations. It's a kind of rupture. It is a deep sense of, of uh, you know, humiliation, the word doesn't capture it because even though that's part of our title, um, it's not just a feeling. It is an extreme sense of ill at ease in society, in one's skin, in relation to others. It is um, a kind of, uh, it's more than a pain. It's, it's part of what we call dehuman, dehumanizing, to feel like not being a human being. And this, as I say, this is an experience we have noticed. Uh, marginalized people have been writing about this for millennia. Um, I've noticed this I have, in conversations with uh, people from Sudan. They talked about humiliation and, and so on. Um, but I think academics, not many academics focus on this. Uh, some do. They come from fields we don't usually blend into conflict theory. Uh, they come from philosophy, which has explored the topic of humiliation and dignity for literally thousands of years to this day. 
They come from wisdom thinkers of many traditions. Um, and they come from who, people who I believe are uh, groundbreaking uh, peacemakers who understand the plight of people. Um, so, but the title of our book is kind of weird. I mean, how can a feeling be systematic? Okay, and that, I think it works, but what is systematic about it is a major theme of this work, and that is power. That is power of systems of inequality. And this is the power of states to create instruments that exploit vulnerable people and intentionally, strategically warp their sense of self in relation to other for disciplinary control. This we see in many sectors of society, obviously in many activist movements. Uh, Black Lives Matter has obviously at the forefront in terms of race in the United States. We see this in many movements in, in many countries where the instruments of power are used to corrupt the sense, the feeling that someone has about themselves in relation to others. Um, so we might say that in our field we talk a lot about direct violence. In a way this theme is not new. Direct violence comes in psychological forms. But what we're exploring is that it's more than direct, it's structural. Systemic humiliation is a process that involves structures, instruments of power that are located in systems of inequality. It is a very long, complicated process. Those structures also assume cultural violence that assumes they're rationalized, it's the feel good, it, it's for security needs to protect the stability, the time-honored traditions. So what we're focusing on here is an attempt or we're proposing to break through the silos of different kinds of violence. What I mean by silos, these are silos in academic minds. That is, it's not, it, it, it is direct, and it's structural, and it's cultural. It is a complicated process. We might call it a hybrid form of violence, but it's only hybrid if we began with these artificial distinctions of different kinds of violence. So we're suggesting, uh, I think, a significant reframing of violence to overcome the mistakes of segmenting people's lives and synthesizing into a continuous process. Um, so we have these instruments of humiliation that my colleagues on this project have written about eloquently. Um, and then in turn, that also suggests other instruments. Why not probe instruments of systematic compassion. Why not take the same kind of this broad framing and flip it and look for instruments to promote the dignity in people. This is not a utopian project, this is a reflective project. And um, I'm happy to be working with my colleague, Professor Susan Allen, on this project beyond this book project. Um, so the, we're promoting an inquiry into what does that look like, systems of compassion? And how is that blended, again, not in some far off dreamland, but how is it already going on in for example, everyday peace communities? How is it already going on in uh, areas where people want to stop the violence and want to promote pro-social values? 
And that's a part of our project. So moving fast forward, so I ha we have these ideas and I thought, well, how am I going to, who's going to like these ideas and who's going to write about them in their different contexts? So I um, appealed to two societies, as it were, two co uh, communities. One, as Dean Averick mentioned, is a community uh, called Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies uh, community, where I met Tony Gasco and many others um, who, are, who contributed to this uh, book project. And my other community, of course, is, is this amazing community that we call the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Um, I just ask the experts and say, what do you think? Um, and one of the challenges, by the way, with asking experts, they're involved in dozens of projects. And I thought, maybe I, I need to buy them lunch or you know, do something or fill in for their class extra. But I didn't have to do any, any of that. I didn't have to do any of that. They gladly offered their valuable time and contributed, I think, um, really important chapters. So um, for this event, we are going to hear from the chapter authors, from some of the chapter authors. Um, and we have, um, if, I, if, if I read their bios, we would be here at least till midnight. So I am shamefully not going to do that, but I will tell you, each of these chapter authors has produced very important work in their respective fields of inquiry. Uh, we have Joseph Montville, who is with us through Blue Jeans, I believe. And um, we also have, as I mentioned, uh, Joseph Monville is a fellow uh, here at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Um, Tony Gasco, to my immediate left, is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford. My colleague, Karina Corstellina, here uh, faculty at uh, School for Conflict Analysis. Um, we also have co-authored work by um, uh, uh, David Raglan from Pacifica uh, College University. Thank you for, I know that perfectly, uh, Pacifica <laughs> Graduate <laughs> Institute. That's what it was, it wasn't facing me. Okay, thank you. And uh, co-authored work with, with my colleague Arthur Romano um, and also my colleague uh, Solon Simmons, uh, again, faculty member here at the School for Conflict Analysis. So we're going to begin with uh, Professor Joseph Montville. Well, thank you, Dan. I, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I'd ask to go first, uh, because there's always a chance that this connection will uh, become unglued. And, uh, this is a very exciting project to work on. Um, my chapter is called The Civil War, 150 Years, Deep Wounds Yet to Heal. And I've come to, uh, from, to, to this approach to our civil war from working on wars and conflict in the Middle East and the world. Um, and I want to say right up front that one of the greatest rewards of being in this project is meeting Tony Gascu. And you'll, you'll understand why when he speaks to you. We have some big plan. Um, but uh, the idea of, of dealing with the Civil War actually came uh, from a, a, a work, uh, a seminar I was doing here. I'm at Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California now. and. I was lucky enough to get Eric Erickson and his wife Joan to be the centerpiece for um, feminine, you know, the psychodynamics of the U.S.-Soviet relationship. And uh, at one point uh, in our deliberations, uh, it occurred to us that we ought to wonder, we were, you know, we were wondering why are the Soviets so crazy? And then it seemed appropriate to ask why are the Americans so crazy? because we were in an inter in interactive relationship that was very, very frightening. Uh, and so uh, 
that was the beginning of my interest in the Civil War, but I didn't have the opportunity to really pursue it for quite a few years after that. But I've been building a library. And uh, I first presented the, the thoughts in this chapter, it's, uh, Reconciliation in, in Tulsa. And uh, I've been developing it ever since. Uh, and it's a big chapter, and I'm not in, going to begin to try to summarize it, but I was focused also on the impact of our current politics, congressional politics, um, of presidential politics, particularly uh, uh, impact of our, our electing our first black president and the, uh, the paralytic effect it had on a major component of our political system. Um, mostly mostly um, traceable to the old Confederacy. Um, and um, the, it was manifested, well, in the decision basically uh, by uh, Mitch McConnell and the Senate Majority Leader in the Senate uh, uh, to say that his goal or, and his party's goal was to make sure that Barack Obama had only one, a, a one-year uh, term. And uh, the more deeply I read into the modern analysis and also the clear it was to me that uh, what we're manifesting, what we're seeing was the manifestation of uh, some of the reconstruction and post-reconstruction of psychology of uh, mostly Southern voters, uh, Southern white voters, um, who have never come, had not yet, you know, simply have not come to terms of their history, their loss in the, in the war, and how it manifests itself in um, electoral solidarity. There's a big dose of uh, uh, evangelical uh, Protestantism, the Southern Baptist Convention, um, and uh, the manifestation of ecology was the what I called uh, 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 electoral well legislative uh, yeah trying to kill the Obamacare in a consistent legislative tantrum, and I think there are up up, up to seventy attempts to, to kill Obamacare. Uh, including the last one that failed by one vote, thanks to John McCain in the Senate. But our history, uh, uh, our, our, our history is never over. It's never past. Uh, and, and that's not my observation. It's uh, well known. And that's what this chapter is. And um, one of the great joys of this is, uh, well, first of all, I managed to get a very good grant from the Carnegie Corporation based on the draft of the chapter that was finally published, uh, the decision by the uh, president of the corporation himself to uh, fund, it, fund the project that we're carrying out at the uh, SCAR Residential Research Center, uh, uh, it, trying to go more deeply with specialists from uh, the history of all of the groups involved in making our history and trying to negotiate a social contract which is far from done yet. I'm, I'm going to end here because you, you'll just have to read it. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you again that um, one of the great joys, in addition to working with Dan as an editor, it's my second time with him, uh, but meeting Tony and plotting the resurrection of our beleaguered country with him through a very practical approach it has been one of the greatest joys of my adult life. And thank you. And now, as a natural transition, <laughs> 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 Professor Tony Gaskow. Wow, well, good evening. Very quickly, when, uh, when you see this image, well, this one here, what do you, what do you think about? What does that image project to you? 
power, what else? Okay, we're off to a, a great start this evening. Um, by the way, that's me. Uh, sometimes I show it to, to remind myself that at one point I was an agent of oppression. It's neither good or bad, negative or positive, it is, it's just a truth. And so sometimes I always want to start with the truth. And that's part of my life journey. So as far as the, the book chapter is concerned, uh, look, it, I can't thank Dan enough for giving me an opportunity to just contribute to such an, an outstanding piece of literature that he put together. So it, again, it's always a pleasure just working with him, being with him, listening to him. And anyone who knows Dan knows that's the truth. But we're going to press on here. Let's do another book. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> okay. Uh, I started the chapter off. I usually start everything that, that I write, everything that I talk about with this, this truth. Uh, as, as social scientists, we all understand that and, and if you look at this panel, uh, and including most of you in the audience, s some of the brightest people in the country trying to work towards conflict resolution. But again, I, I challenge every single person. We know the truths of systems of oppression. There's not a person in this room that does not know the truths of a system of oppression. And if you know that to be the truth, if you are not waking up every single morning with the goal of dismantling a system of oppression, I'm sorry, you are the oppressor, period. Because if you want this change to happen, you can make it happen. We create systems of oppression, we can take them down. And part of what I wrote about in my chapter was trying to take down a specific system of oppression. That would make a, a great course here, wouldn't it, Dan? Dismantling systems of oppression. I like it. I just thought of it. I don't. I know the dean. <laughs> okay. Um, in my humble opinion, probably the the greatest system of oppression, and and because it was specifically designed to to carry out an agenda to hurt. Again, in, in my humble opinion the first indigenous people on the planet. And I know sometimes when, when you're black in America, you're not looked at as part of the indigenous population. But I, I'm here to remind every single person in this room that that's a fact. And, and when you're in this country and you begin to understand an institution was designed to make you suffer. And it's, it's hard not to start with this. So, that's where I laid the, the theme of my chapter. Okay, you know, just like a, uh, an assembly line, policing, courts, and corrections, the criminal justice system is fueled by policing. They are the gatekeepers. I spent 20 years as one. I can assure you, nothing moves until police take action, period. So I wanted to focus my attention on stopping where the system oppression enters everyone's life into policing. Okay. Sometimes, you know, I don't know. I think when, when Dan first read some of these words, I don't know whether he scratched his head and said, okay, unfriending. Look, um, I, I think Dan eloquently started this conversation by infusing in us the memory of what the power that compassion and love and kindness have. And in the chapter, I simply said for black people in America to try to, to liberate themselves, they have to hold back some love and compassion 
and mercy from the policing culture. That's it. I, I don't know. And, and if anyone in here believes in the law of causation, karma, then everyone in here understands that when, when you provide someone your love, man, the universe is going to give it back to you tenfold. But in the same regard, I'm sure that most of us in here can, can eloquently say if you were ever in a bad relationship and it was just time to walk away, no fighting, no words of war. You, you simply take a left when the other person takes a right. In this chapter, I, I ask black people in America to take a right, to, to leave the policing culture to itself. And again, if, if there's karma, we were born to be connective. A social institution like policing has almost destroyed that feeling. You know, and, and again, I don't want to harp too much because reading the chapter is a lot more interesting than listening to me talk about some of it. Uh, liberation, and again, I'm not shy. Uh, I, am a, I am a student of Abdul Amin, uh, H. Rap Brown, Kwame Tur, Stokely Carmichael, uh, those who wanted to create a revolutionary consciousness. And I firmly believe that if you are black in America, it's in your cultural DNA to resist. You know, H. Rap Brown said every political, black political birth in America has to be political. Because if, if you put someone in a situation where they have to fight, then you, you can't expect anything other than that. This liberation starts with freeing your mind. And in the chapter, I simply send the message that the three things that I find most comforting to me in my life at times are <coughs> memory, ritual, and healing. And they're all tied together. When I say memory, anytime that I want to speak to my ancestors, I think about them. Anytime that I have a question that I can't answer, I think my dad is 89 years old. There's nothing more special in this country than an 89-year-old black man because there's nothing that he has not seen. There's nothing. There's no pain that he hasn't seen. There's, 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 there's no echo of evil that he hasn't tasted, that our country has fed him almost every day of his life. And so when, when I look for answers today, I call my dad. And he laughs most of the time, by the way, because he, he fishes every day. He's, he's, that, he's at that part of his life's journey where if he's not fishing, he's not living. But when I want to speak to my ancestors, my dad reminds me of who I am. He reminds me that I was born in inner city Chicago, that we didn't have five cents if it would take a nickel to go around the world, we'd have to stay at home. We were poor. He reminds me to, to stay humble. And he reminds me that it's my duty to tell these truths. This liberation is going to be metaphysical. It has to be from within. Because that's what we owe to the universe. The universe gives us things, and we give back to the universe. There's a physical component to this as well. If there were two black people on every American jury, instead of 97% of the people in this country pleading guilty to every single crime, if only half went to trial, the criminal justice system buckles. Do we realize that's how simple it is? Is that if somebody invokes their right to go to trial, the criminal justice system can't handle that. If you just put two black people on every single jury, where, where someone who says, show me that I am guilty, says that 12 people have to prove that, half the people would go to trial because you'd be acquitted. It's, it's quite that simple. 
the other half of that, and as I'll close now, I talk about reparations. I talk about the, the billions of dollars each year that our country seizes in forfeitures, that that money could go back to restoring justice in the lives of every single person, not just, not just black, but every single person who's had a negative contact with what we call the criminal justice system. Dan, again, guys, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Sure. Uh, I think Arthur, because it's a similar topic. Um, I'm not Arthur, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm David Ragland. And um, I'll just give you like a little bit of intro and a few points. Um, Arthur and I met um, actually in Ferguson uh, through Darren Cambridge, who's in the back. And um, Darren was like, yo, you got to meet this guy and his brother. He's dope. Um, <laughs> and I, I knew of Arthur because we had, were both in the area of peace education. And, you know, we had been kind of following each other in our careers, uh, working with some of the same groups. And um, he was with uh, Dr. Bernard Lafayette when I met him. And since then, we've been working closely together around um, Truth Telling Project in Ferguson and uh, Arthur helped me to start the, the project. And this was a chance for us to reflect, um, to sit down and reflect about the work that um, we did with activists, me as somebody who's from that area in St. Louis and uh, as, as an academic as well. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about this chapter which um, you know, primarily uh, around truth-telling or the notion of truth and reconciliation. And we, we started this project, it was a number of us, a number of community um, activists, um, just random people who had come to protest and people who um, I had went out and met uh, while protesting. And at the time when Michael Brown was murdered, um, by Darren Wilson right right before that um, it was I was teaching uh, not far from here at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania and so I had I would go home or I went home because August the 9th is my mother's birthday and my nephew's birthday and I remember having this conversation about going home um, but that the idea for the project initially came when uh, Kamani uh, Gray, not Kamani Gray, but Kajimi Powell was killed across the street from my parents' house. Um, and that was a few weeks after Mike Brown had got killed. And when you think about the, the notion of uh, humiliation, this young man um, had supposedly stolen two cans, two, two cans of power drink. He sat them on the curb. Within five seconds uh, of police arriving, he was dead. And you can count it, one, two, three, four, five. And everybody in the neighborhood knew, Kama knew Kajemi. And they knew that um, he had um, some issues, um, you know, like um, where he may have needed some mental health support. And so that was, for me, I could see as I looked at the video of him pacing back and forth. You know, when, when every time a black person is killed in this country, it kind of adds to this kind of existential anxiety, this reinforcing of a feeling that my life doesn't matter. So truth telling as a quasi truth commission became a way for folks to tell their own stories and to hear each other 
And you know, we, we had offers from the State Department and other groups to, why don't you become a commission? Like we can support you and, or even police to come in um, and do dialogues. You know, and people was like, man, why the fuck I wanna have a dialogue with people who've been shooting at me? Like it's, it's common sense. Like why would I trust sitting down in a situation of asymmetric power differences? Let me put it in your language so you can understand. <laughs> why would I trust that anything will come out of it? And so when you think about who's telling the story, who's the commissioners, who's listening to the stories, it was Mama Cat. It was other folks from the community who had lived there. We didn't want the, um, it was the, uh, the state police uh, director uh, who wanted to come and, and witness our stories. People didn't want that because they didn't trust it. So what does it mean for communities to actually develop a process where they can tell their own stories, archive it, and then have those stories present like a particular set of values, a particular set of wants and needs about what justice means, right? It means that like people are validating their own stories and they're trying to understand from their own experience and build outside or in an altar space uh, um, a sense of what justice could mean. And so just a few more points, you know, and you know, I think about the notion of uh, humiliation in this sense, where humiliation is a result of a larger system of humiliation. You know, where the way that we are viewed or view this society or the way that power presents itself in this society is through control, right? Through control where everybody is essentially, um, as opposed to the possibility of freedom, there's the possibility of some kind of infraction or punishment, right? So in a larger sense, right, there's this kind of uh, uh, underlying view of scarcity or s control of scarce resources or just general control. And that framework um, is also undergirded by white supremacy and white supremacy through a lens of coloniality, you know, where we see, you know, Maldonado Torres, for instance, you know, he talks about how um, in, in 1492, I think that was the date that he was speaking of, somebody can correct me, but the book is Against War. Um, and he speaks on um, how in this particular moment, we have the quote unquote discovery of this land and the Pope uh, telling, um, you know, or saying that Amer Amer Indians are human if they convert. At the same moment, Descartes is saying, I think, therefore I exist. And he suggests that this is the moment where Western society fails to even address or contemplate on whether or not they are superior. It was a given. So white supremacy as one of the undergirding um, functions or frameworks um, kind of like presents a lens for which we have to contend with today. And W. E. Du Bois talks about it in terms of double consciousness, which is like black folks might see the world in one way, right? And so if that's the case, you know, where we're seeing the world in one way, where we're told that if you do A, B, and C, you are right, we know that that will never happen. So imagine living in a world where like your very existence is in danger and there's, like it's deeply humiliating when holding Starbucks or a phone in your hand, right, will get you killed. But it's not even that, it's just being black will get you killed, or arrested at Starbucks, um, Waffle House, or a number of different places. Uh, so read the chapter. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, 
so I'll just I'll uh, reflect on some points that Dave set up, uh, I think, in a really powerful way. Um, so the chapter also talks about the Truth Telling Project, and the Truth Telling Project uh, brought families who had lost loved ones to police violence together from across the country. Some of those folks who came together were people who you would know by name, like Michael Brown's father and Sandra Bland's sister, but many of them would be people who um, we've never heard of. And in doing so, we asked people what they would want, uh, because it, we, there was a call inside the protest movement, and I think it's important to, to note that um, Ferguson may have been the longest standing uh, protest, street level protest since the Montgomery bus boycott. So oh, well over a year that there was continuous protest happening, happening in Ferguson, something that's largely not covered by the media. So that creates a way for, for conversations to kind of uh, develop over time. And people were clear in that they wanted to um, continue to remember those who, who have lost their lives and to think t about how to change the systems that were that were creating uh, the, the context in which black people were being killed in the United States by police and facing a whole range of indignities. Uh, and what happened was a, a kind of emergent pedagogy, a, a, a way in which the community came together, uh, um, people in the community in St. Louis and Ferguson, and then the folks who had experienced police violence across the country, and develop activities where, they, where people could come and share their stories to people they felt comfortable with. And then also um, we brought in many organizations that were doing social justice work so that people could then uh, engage in conversation. So it was not only uh, to, for folks to share their experiences with police violence in a supportive environment, but also to ask the question, why do we think this is happening and what can we do to change it? So there's a sort of ecosystem of, of organizations that were involved in an ongoing set of conversations. It developed into all kinds of things that we probably could have never imagined from the beginning. Uh, including you know, concerts with artists that were really tapping into and, and challenging uh, white supremacy and, and thinking into what, a, a, what social justice could look like at the community level. High school students leading mural projects, spoken word arts, uh, people doing storytelling for social justice, so analyzing how do um, stories that are often marginalized by the media, um, how can we tell stories in ways that kind of uh, uh, challenge that the ways in which our stories are being concealed. Um, and so a, a whole series of, of events took place. Um, there were all, you know, it was, it was a very um, powerful process. I, I would encourage folks to read the chapter. There's also a, uh, a web portal where you can see direct testimony from folks that gave testimony during the Truth Telling Project that it's, uh, it's time to listen.org. And in, in those, in, on that web page, which is, cur is currently being redone, so it will be up in the next week or so, uh, those stories are paired with the systemic issues that people in their testimony raise. So if they raise issues, if someone was in the military and they experienced police violence afterwards, it looks at issues of, of, um, of you know, the relations between African Americans and the military and their experiences at home. So a whole range of issues that are, just to give one example, that are raised there. So it becomes an online learning portal where allied groups that want to show the films and then have conversations in their communities can, that want to organize and think about how to respond, uh, can also do so. And uh, I'll just end with saying um, that as I've just done work with the Truth Telling Project and sharing these stories, I, I find that um, especially with privileged folks and, and white folks, um, there's a real pushing of our attention span to be able to hear about what happens to families when, uh, when they've lost a loved one to police violence. The mainstream media uh, oftentimes does not uh, provide an opportunity for us to think about how communities are infected, uh, impacted by this. Uh, I think often of, of the first time I heard Michael Brown testify, his father, in which he said, I felt um, uh, that when I, my son was born that I made a silent pact to keep him safe. And there's not a day that goes by where I don't think about what I could have done to maybe protect him. He talks about his son being a big, being big at an early age, 10 years old, quite a big kid, and worrying right from then about him being bullied and targeted, right? In a way that confronts us to make a, in, a, in our humanity. And I think in some ways, uh, from my side of it, as, 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 a, as a white man uh, now in a privileged position, uh, to think about what it means to stand with people, other fathers, 
uh, other community members, my extended, my extended community and family to, in, in responding to, make, to influencing a system such that we don't, um, that people are not put in that position, right? Um, so for anybody who's here, I'd encourage you to, to um, also try to use the resources. Uh, and it's been also very powerful to see the national and international ripple that's come from this as people have experimented with truth telling in their own communities and native communities in North America and, uh, and also in communities ar around the world. So I'm thinking a lot in closing about ripple effects and uh, pedagogical diffusion is, is like, to, as J Dave said, to put it in y'all's language, which is also my language too, right? Pedagogical diffusion about how we can do, how we can experiment as, as collectives of people across lines of race and class to do work together and how, um, how quickly in this, in this day and age others can, um, can connect to those experiments and, and kind of learn from some of the principles and some of the challenges uh, and, and seek to do that work. Uh, in their own communities. There's plenty in there also about the challenges of what comes up in the work for us, a fraction of the challenges that are faced, but some of them um, in a way that I think is useful because this obviously is not easy work and it's not itself outside of power dynamics of victimization, uh, of power dynamics that are in relation to how we show up together. So uh, it is not a utopic space, as Dan said, but a place in which we're doing that difficult um, work of, uh, of trying to build social justice uh, at a very local level and, and, and seek to influence other communities that are interested in doing so. I just have to say thank you to Dan for the opportunity for this to be in the book. I want to th say thank you to Kuldeep, who is here, was my research assistant last semester and helped us both in getting the chapter together. And it's time for me to pass the mic. That's too, Karina. Thank you. <laughs> Before I start speaking, ha, what happened? Okay. Before I will start speaking about the book, I want to celebrate another event which just happened today. It's not my personal event, but I think it's another uh, event which helps to finish another system of humiliation. Bill Cosby was uh, today. Uh, court told that he's guilty finally after two trials. So I think it's another system of humiliation for which is. I think we should really take down. But um, I didn't write about this particular topic. I wrote about something else. And again, thank you very much, Dan, for putting together this wonderful, exciting project. Uh, then Dan asked me if I can and interested to contribute. I told, of course, because I'm always interested. And then uh, I found that uh, insult the one which I spent entire book project on, will be very interesting to see how insult really functions as a mechanism of humiliation. Because then we speak about humiliation, then we speak about system, we really need to show what are factors which contribute to its dynamics. And for me, insult was one of the most important mechanisms. One insult, why insult? Insult is not just simple, incivility or sim simple uh, absence of uh, good manners. Insult always have normative function. Insult always targets the border between people, always targets the other, trying to redefine positioning of the other within the system of identity and power. Insults usually help people to put down or strip other people of their positive identity. It's helped to reduce their power, remove their legitimacy. Insults help to redefine border, make it maybe very strong and unpermittable between one person and another. So insults are usually very powerful instruments. So for me, it was important how insults actually function within the system of systemic humiliation. And let me see. So I, because we really were trying in this project to address issue of power, I was trying to find free, and I define in my chapter, these three forms of humiliation process. <clears throat> 
One is hierarchical humiliation, that it's a symmetrical uh, humiliation which coming from people part in power towards somebody who is usually marginalized or in a lower position. Reverse humiliation, it's a process that people who experience long time chronic humiliation use humiliation to answer for, to protect themselves. And finally, reciprocal humiliation, it's exchange of between two mostly equal parties in this time. So let me speak, and I use three different cases <coughs> to explore them, explore how insult functions as a mechanism within these three forms of humiliation and power. Hierarchical humiliation, again, it really aims to strip part of positive identity wants to stress social boundary between parties and also want to justify discrimination against other in particular way. And I analyze how identity insult, again identity insult one, which three people of positive identity, projection insult, which help us to justify our actions by blaming the other, and divergence insult, this insult which help us to establish social boundary between people, how they will function. And I pick very old case which probably everyone knows very well, uh, Lord, but I retell it through insult. And it's a story of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, for those who know the story, the very important to understand geography or spatial characteristic of this city. It was divided in three major parts. Rich whites, poor, blue color whites, and African Americans, poor too. So then finally, the city was selected to create the uh, segregation, and uh, the city hall had to make a decision which school will be selected as the first example of desegregation. You are students of power and social positioning. Who were in the city hall? Who were people who were making the decision? Representative of this wealthy white part. Social boundary in this time, remember it's a time of very strong deep segregation. Social boundary was between who and who? In the city. Whites and blacks, whites and African American, exactly. So what this city hall is doing? It's redefining social boundary. It's now telling that yes, we will desegregate, but we will choose a school in the poorest white place. So boundary is now not between the white and African American, boundary now between rich and poor. So we will create, we will be not touched by the segregation. It's not our problem, but you will deal with that. And what happens with this, remember again, it's a city with very uh, poor white population which were increasing their self-esteem by putting down, down people, minorities, African Americans, so on. Then they now have to desegregate. They don't have any other reason to put down anyone else. Now they are put down by the others. So this insult was put on them. So now you have to deal with it. We, we are not dealing with it. And what happens, um, again, you know very well story, that eight students were brought to the school, eight African-American schools, with a lot of violence uh, against students, against school, uh, they had to call the National Guard to protect students, and it uh, lasted only one year. It didn't repeat it next year again. That was one failing example. Thanks God, like we have this desegregation now in many places, but again, as we discussed, it, desegregation mostly happening in uh, many places for middle class. If you look into Kirby, we're working together with Kirby here. He's my assistant, Oscar assistant for project I work now in uh, for, uh, for uh, neighborhoods in Washington DC area, African American and Latino neighborhoods, which do not see desegregation, right? Not at all. Um, 
Okay, so this is both first, first example. Uh, second example, okay, uh, okay. I will spoke about Michael Brown just to <laughs> I have a minute. So um, this case, it just show you that I was really interested to explore why, um, how the systemic humiliation which experienced by African American population actually led to their experience, how, why exactly it was how long protest, why so many insults were incorporated in this process as reverse uh, humiliation. And finally, it's the process of humiliation, which you see, I don't, again, don't need to spend a lot of time on it. I pick a specific case. I speak a case of uh, development of Iranian deal and how, uh, yes, how Democrats and Republicans were insulting each other for three months, every day, coming with wonderful insults. For example, Republican speaker invited Prime Minister Netanyahu, who came and spoke to uh, Congress but never visited president, right? And then there were a lot of letters written from both sides, a lot of statements making by both sides, which both tried to really strip others of power and legitimacy. So this was continuous systemic humiliation, which actually we see right now between political parties too. Again, this project was for, to explore how insult as a mechanism function within different system of humiliation, and it really gave me opportunity to explore the role of power in humiliation processes. Okay. Professor Solon Simmons. Uh, thank you, and thanks to Dan and all the members of the panel for really interesting conversation. There's so many things that it makes me think about and that I'd like to say, and to helps me to try to characterize, you know, the, the larger project of which this paper is just an example. Let me just say that the best way to think about this project, that, this paper that I wrote, was to put it in the context of what I'm calling root narrative theory, and it's the foundations of moral conflict. And what do I mean by that? So if you think about, we, I like David's point about languages that you understand and speaking languages because so much of what I think drives conflict is, that, is what Oliver Ramsbotham calls radical disagreement. What um, John Burton actually had a very similar idea, who is an important figure here that we often refer to, we talk about his basic human needs, but I think what was interesting about Burton was not so much that, but his idea that there were conflicts which could be traded and negotiated. There were things that were basically interest-based. And then there was stuff that was just deeper than that. And there were things that you just couldn't get over that were deeply emotional and challenging and, uh, and things that you just couldn't unthink once you saw them in a certain way. Those were what conflicts were. And the other things he called disputes, and not everyone likes that distinction because people do dispute resolution and they think about it deeply and they engage very systematic issues, but that's ultimately what John Burton was trying to do and I think that's what we're trying to rediscover in this kind of this concept that Ramsbotham is playing with a radical disagreement, and uh, and what a lot of us are interested in. And um, so, what it you know, radical comes from the you know Latin for root. And so, what are the roots of all this? Well, for I, you know, you, we're talking a lot about power, and we're talking about the abuse of power. My students in the room will know that I've got a, a approach to this which is trying to think about the various kinds of institutional mechanisms, so trying to tie this back to institutional mechanisms, ways in which uh, things that even if you unthink them, they still operate. And then I'm a sociologist by training, and it's natural for me to do that, and you know, there are different ways you can approach this. I won't get into all of it, but just to say, the ones that I've settled on are these networks of overlapping power, social power, that proponents of uh, those institutions think about as being uh, pro-social, good. They think that they're good. And uh, people who suffer from them know are bad. That's, I think, part of what we're saying here, the truths that we're speaking, is that these things are, in fact, not, they are abused. You know, these are abu this is abuse of social power, and so every form of power, it's kind of like a Newtonian reframe, if you will, I guess, has a corresponding abuse. You know, that there's, there's no power which is inherently good, but you can't live without power. Power is a wonderful thing. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't be speaking through microphones and living under lights and everything else. But at the same time, if you find yourself on the asymmetric side of it, right on the downside of that, you've, you, um, you experience uh, deep injustice and it's something fundamental. So what I was trying to understand is thinking about the United States. It's, you know, I'm a student of my dissertation years ago is on elections in the United States, and I'm fascinated by how it is that you can have things 
like the Trump effect, and before that, I was you know I I started becoming fascinated by this with Ross Perot way back when. But so anyway, so we're trying to think about what are the roots of these, what are these institutions, and how do they work? And so what 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 it basically I've boiled this down to is that there are four paradigmatic institutions, and each one has its form of abuse as well. And you can think about this in terms of four virtuoso thinkers. Uh, each one identifies the form of power and, and how it's abused. And th these correspond, if you will, to what John Paul Lederick calls the moral imagination. And I describe these in terms of aspects or categories of the moral imagination. So let me begin with one that I think is most critical here, which is what I call the dignitarian imagination. And that is the kind of imagination that emerges around the institutional, the institution of cultural power, in particular the capacity to promote intolerance through social networks, which are sort of outside of other kind of formal channels. They are these, these are lived experience. This is through our lives, how we live, and we don't even recognize them. They're just how we live. And these networks of socialization, we might call them the means of representation as well, uh, lead to all sorts of potentially deeply humiliating contexts, and that's why film is so important, why literature. You know, last, last, last night, I guess a couple of my students here, we were dealing with Patricia Hill Collins' work, and we're talking about you know, how it is that, uh, in, that the culture structures perpetuate a kind of a matrix, a cultural matrix, which allows for these kind of humiliations to be experienced in thousands of different ways in different venues. So anyway, the dignitarian imagination, I think, is a critical way of confronting the world as we experience it. And for me, the great thinker in this tradition is Franz Fanon. So that's the archetypal thinker, if you will. And I think that whenever you look at the world through this lens, it, it provides you with a complete language a way of seeing, and it's impossible almost to unsee once these things once you've seen them. But there are a number of other traditions of institutional power that have played out over, uh, really I think all of history, but uh, you can see these things and you can tell this through the development of the Enlightenment. And I'll just highlight these and suggest different potential bases for how some people can know that they are telling you vital truths and you can know that they're telling you lies, and vice versa. And the, the first of these is Thomas Hobbes, and I think you can't unthink the, the concern with security. I always say that fear is critical and that we're, we're being guided by fear right now and I think that so much of what we're talking about here and so much of the uh, indignity that is being perpetuated is, in the, is somehow being justified in this way. And to confront that, you have to confront that paradigm, what I'd call the securitarian imagination. But also, and a really critical one, and this is really important because we don't really take it seriously enough, is what we might call classical liberalism, which is, which is oriented to the abuse of power of government. Because what the, this concern that these classical liberals, I mean, Mason is, cla is, is really critical for this, this Virginia School of Political Economy, because we specialize in the abuses or, or detailing the language of abuse of the government itself, that is of the legal entity uh, that has the monopoly of the legitimate use of force. And so these libertarians, this libertarian imagination, I don't just mean the political party, I mean it a small l, who, for, for in the way that we might be saying cultural elites are the, the main focus, the, 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 the source of abuse, which leads to indignation, the indignity, not indignation, but indignity. Uh, but so too, there's this other group. And so how do you address this kind of a group who resorts to the language of anti-government um, freedom and why do they come out with a three-point corner hats and all that business. And how do you engage that kind of person and actually have them hear you when they are going to be speaking truths to you that you can't hear and understand and then and from a position of power imposing their world view and doing uh, tremendous violence with it. And I think that's a really important thing to think about. And then a, third, a fourth, which I don't think has been um, addressed all that much and is what I call the egalitarian imagination in, in a specific sense of it. You might call it the majoritarian in a certain way, but I think egalitarian is better, which is, comes from the, the, the tradition that of, of, of socialism, of concern with the power of economic elites, and the entire language that emerges around that, and how that can play as a kind of a, an alternative frame as well that can be distracting from a certain point of view uh, with respect to questions of of intolerance, abuse, and, uh, and the indignity that communities suffer. And yet it's a, a powerful language. We saw this in the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. Before that, we saw it with the Ralph Nader phenomenon. You see it coming back again and again because there is something different about that language. And it also speaks a vital truth. It may not have the answers, 
uh, certainly not all of them, but I suspect that none of these various um, roots of confrontation have all the answers. And I, I, my own perspective is that if these are organized in what I call it the circle of power, and you can think of it as a color wheel, that the only path forward to some kind of brighter future is to go for full spectrum justice. And you've got to have some perspective in which we address the various abusive forms of each of these uh, institutional networks, because I don't think they're fantasies, Ni none of them are. And that's why you've had these political movements that have organized historically around each one of them. Nationalism being a, one of the great movements in the, in, in the Hobbesian vein. Well, obviously socialism has had its, had its heyday. And classical liberalism is, is, is entrenched in a very deep way. And I think what we're doing is we're pioneering, and we're not pioneering, we're living a tradition that goes back at least to the era of decol decolonization. And so working in that kind of a complex space, we see radical disagreements and we're forced to explore languages to reach across the aisle. Uh, and that's the, that's the spirit in which I uh, wrote this piece um, uh, for this book. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So um, uh, we're, we will have time for questions. And um, are there extra mics? We need a couple. We need, we need to so keep these here. Yeah, we need to keep <coughs> the two here. This one. Oh, you want? OK. Yes. OK. So please. Um, questions, comments, uh, does anyone have an opinion about anything uh, that was said here? Um, wow. Yeah, anything. Yeah, what would you, yeah, thank you, Susan. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Siabulela Mandela. I'm from South Africa. I'm more uh, touched deeply by the presentation on the chapter that looks into uh, truth-telling and reconciliation. I'm, I'm more deeply touched because in South Africa after the post, um, uh, after the transition from the brutal and uh, most violent uh, system called the apartheid in the country, we went, we undergone a process of the same process, I think, similar to what uh, Arthur and David have presented, but for us it was called Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, which was basically um, premised on an idea that we ought to, in order for the nation to move forward, we must open the wound and put a bit of salt in it, and through the process of telling the stories about the injustices of the past, so the question I want to ask is on the fact that ours uh, was based on a model where not only did the victims came and told their stories, but also the perpetrators themselves. They came in and confessed or tell their stories to say, look, I've done this and that, and I'm here to ask for forgiveness. And whether the committees agrees to give them amnesty, it was another story. So I wanted to know if that particular project, did it have these aspects where the perpetrators themselves come forward? Because I think this argument is uh, put forward by, obviously in dif different context, by Franz Fanon on the Wretched of the Earth, I think also by Paul Frey on the pedagogy of the oppressed, when they argue that even the oppressors themselves need to be liberated from the thinking of oppressing the other because they themselves are enslaved by such, uh, such an attitude. So that's one question. The second question ties in the argument that was presented by Tony and also by Solon. I think uh, Solon touched based on the works of John Barton uh, who brought forward a proposition that there are certain needs that are unnegotiable. Uh, which we cannot, under any circumstance, circumstances, negotiate on. And for 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 us as South Africans, and I, I, I think this uh, brought a, a lot of grief from most of the South Africans. I mean, even myself, and majority of South Africans who are still angry today against those who oppressed us, because in that process of truth telling, it ties back to the process of truth telling. No one has overcame forward and admitted uh, the fact that 
they have stole something from me. For us in South Africa, they, they've stole our economy or the means, uh, the, the, the economic power of the people in the form of land. They stole our land. No one came and said, look, uh, I stole these hectares of land and I would like to bring them back. You know, so as a result, we never got the true uh, restoration that Tony was talking about. You know, even today, we are still living as a divided nation. I think it was in 2012 when a report by the, uh, United, uh, the World Bank uh, characterized South Africa as one of the most unequal societies in the world. Even though everyone else celebrates our democracy uh, outside in the world, but inside it's something completely different. So mm. those are the questions that I wanted to bring forward. Okay. Thank you. So Arthur and David first? Or? Um, and do you want to address testing. that? Also? All right, can oh. you hear me? So yeah, I think that's a, a really important conversation that we dealt with quite a bit. Um, and you know, just in terms of the notion of truth and reconciliation, you know, one of the things that a traditional TRC um, represents in general is a, a formal end to conflict. Like there's a formal end to a conflict and then there's a process by which, you know, or some agreed upon, you know, end. And in, in, in this country, like, we see people killed by police every day. So, you know, I often wonder what's an insult to somebody being murdered. Um, but then, at the same time, when you think about reconciliation, even the term reconciliation, it means that, like, we're gonna reconcile. Like, we had something at first. I wonder what the fuck we had other than a system of oppression. And so when you think about, you know, even the reason why we didn't like bring in other folks in, into, you know, oppressors, right, quote unquote, it's because people were traumatized. They didn't want, like, even in, like I've worked with police officers before in the past and, you know, and you know, one example is, I kept saying Kamani Gray because I was thinking about him. He was killed by the NYPD. And his teacher runs, you know, restorative justice circles. And she had asked them, because the police had been reaching out saying, hey, why don't we do a circle, you know, with police as well? Well, every time, you know, somebody is killed, those kids are re-traumatized. And so, when you have a larger society that doesn't even recognize that killing black folks is wrong, you know, why should these kids actually be forced to sit there with them? You know, and, and you know, so I just keep wondering reconcile to what? Because my thought and, and our thought in truth telling is in, in order to get to, you know, forgiveness, like you know, we have to ask that question, what does it mean to be human? And when do black folks get a chance to mourn, to cry about our baby being killed, right? To have a few expletives. Am I less human because I say a curse word or have a tattoo right here? And that's what Ferguson meant. It's like Amiri, Bar Amiri Baraka wrote um, in his uh, poem, Revolutionary, theater, he said, and they will run through the streets spitting craziness, but a craziness taught to them at in their most sane moments. And so one of the other issues is, you know, uh, being pushed toward forgiveness, like those folks in South Carolina. You, know, you expected to forgive somebody right after they just murdered everybody, and there's like, there should be reciprocity, and often, you know, one of the stages of forgiveness is some kind of reciprocity. Like, there has to be a receiver of forgiveness. Why would I forgive you if, like, you don't want it? Now, personally, I, I forgive all the time. But, you know, forgiveness for black folks, that's, a, that's like asking, it's a political question, asking all black people to forgive. And, and that's, that's not fair, it's actually dehumanizing to, to force folks to be 
forgiving and, and loving like Dr. King and singing some Negro spirituals. Oh, we'll overcome together. No, pay reparations. That's how we get to reconciliation. And it's like, who's teaching at the institutions? What do they look like? What do the students look like? Do we got black folks from the community who live right down the street from here, students in here? That's what reparations looks like. How do we repair? Because after the truth telling, people go home to the same material conditions. And that's, that's why many of the, in the student movement in South Africa, that's why we see what's happening now, the reclaiming of land, and this new president who's speaking about things like that. I would just add, <laughs> how can I add to that? <laughs> I mean, Dave, Dave, I think, talks about it, um, impact so clearly that this question that you raise to me was one of the richest parts of the truth-telling process. Um, how do we create the conditions for reconciliation and forgiveness? And is reconciliation and forgiveness potentially a byproduct of challenging the asymmetry of, of building power and communities of care and support together? Um, does some reconciliation happen when not, we, I think in conflict resolutions, um, really privileged speech acts. So we think it happens and I understand you and you understand me and we give like a high five and say we're reconciled. <laughs> but might it happen from structural changes where you are not allowed to, uh, to discriminate in housing anymore? Or you, you must provide opportu equal opportunities and so therefore, it, you know, over time I'm, I have to see you you know, I think we think of it as a kind of, as a consent, as a kind of moment of, of awareness. That's one piece. And just on the second piece on the conflict resolution, it, we, it made me think a lot about active listening. Uh, active listening fell really flat for me. So when I teach my, <laughs> now my reflective practice classes, it's great to active listen. But when you have cognitive frames for making sense of a situation already, all your active listening does is drive you into those frames harder right so if i am as a white person uh, unaware of the historical context let's say as a teacher in a high school of the policing of black girls voices as loud disruptive dangerous and necessary for control exclusion etc if i don't know that history over time then how am I going to make sense of her behavior in response to an institution that has that's not serving her the conversation is going to be about defiance and how we clean up the, the, the impacts of defiance. And I could listen hard to what she's saying, right? But if there's not a way for her, if, if I don't have some cognitive frames to, for her um, to hear what she's, what she's saying or to see the larger context, then active listening isn't going to do it. Now, it's better than tuning out, maybe. But... Um, but we, but listening itself is also not transformative. So speech acts aren't automatically transformative, and n nor is li active listening, right? And so there was a lot in about these. What are the conditions of forgiveness? What does it mean to bring folks, as Dave said, into who have experienced a trauma into context in which people may not be able to hear them, and the questions they're going to ask are going to be ones that reframe them as deviant or lacking or othering them, and so. Um, a, lot, a lot of it was in that piece. And then also, if, the, if humiliation is systemic and power is systemic, then, um, then in changing police behavior, we also need to be in a conversation about how are we changing uh, systems. And, and, and police may have a, you know, have a role in helping to change those systems. But a lot of the reconciliation work, I think, ter um, turns on, uh, on an interpersonal uh, relationship building without um, us thinking about how can we be allies in changing the system of how we do policing or how we distribute um, economic resources. So how do we, it's in a way I hear a question in your question that was brought up many times in truth telling, which is how do we address systems of control and systems of exploitation and keep the, our eye on the system part. Thank you. Karina, do you want? I just want, uh, want to add uh, some comparative perspective on it because then you speak about forgiveness and you speak about apology. 
uh, apology should be connected with particular actions which follow the apology. And um, I recently done research, I'm going to do more research this summer on relationship between Korea and Japan. And why, while Japan apologized 14 times and says, well, sorry, we, we really regret what have been done. South Korea still believes the apology is not sincere, not have taken it. And why? Because actions which actually Japanese government is doing, denying, not teaching about forced labor, about comfort women, going to Yakushima uh, shrine <laughs> at least two, three times a uh, uh, year, where criminal A, uh, type A criminals, war criminals are enshrined. So it's very important that this process is a wonderful process of forgiveness and reconciliation, but if actions are not really confirming that there is a change in attitudes, then it does not have any sense. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Next question. I yes, Tehema. Yes, we, you have to use the mic. All righty. Okay. Hi, my name is Tehema Lopez Bunyasi. I am a faculty member here at SCAR. And it's either today or tomorrow that um, they will be opening up the, I believe it's a national lynch, I don't know what it's called, what's but you, I know it's, yeah. I've seen the, the graphics, and the, right, it's today, right, um, in Montgomery, Alabama. And um, what lynching, what lynching is, what it was, um, it, and that it's more, that it's more than hanging a person's body from a tree or right. a bridge. That's right. That the mutilation, the the display, the the selling, the I mean, the and the memorial and sending pieces of body parts. I mean, and it. I just I would like to know what everyone is um, like in this moment. Which first of all is a major. Um, I'm so grateful to Brian Stevenson and to all the people who supported this project to put this together. And he's he's so committed, and so are the people who have backed him. But um, in Montgomery, Alabama, too, I used to work there. Um, I d how, what what is the panel thinking about about their maybe their works in particular, um, but on this one. on this particular uh, moment and th what this memorial is standing for? Tony, did you want to? Well, that was a. Um, well, first of all, white supremacy is a mental illness. It's a, it's a state of mind. Uh, memorials are, are, I guess, they're great for white Americans. Who, who didn't know that black people were lynched? I mean, what's that supposed to do? I mean, systems of oppression, they don't apologize. They do. And, you know, we can sit here and we can debate theory all day. Unless you are taking action to dismantle. Look, that, that monument is, policing doesn't care about that. Do you think the police officer that works in this city cares about that? No. So what's the, what, what's the conversation about? I mean, I look, we have to stop believing that reform is in the vocabulary of conflict resolution. Dismantlement. You can't change the way someone feels about you if they have a gun. I mean, does anyone here, is, has anyone here ever been a, a victim of gun violence? Okay. There's, there's not, we're in one of the best conflict resolution programs in the country. Someone please tell me your negotiating strategy when someone points a gun at you. You see how theory sort of dwindles down to nothing. I think it is a wonderful idea that brings white America five moments of relief when they see a monument. I really do. It's not telling black folks anything. Zero. In, in, in fact, in fact, I would probably go further to say that, uh, I don't piggyback what David said. Look, let's, let's see some real stuff, real things. How, you know, how about every 
black person in America getting a $5 million check. No, you, you want to impress me? That's what impresses me. How about disarming all police? That would impress me. Uh, monuments are good to placate the colonized. You know, if you, if you think that you have to call the police in here for anything, you are colonized. If your brother and your sister are police officers and you love them because they come over for Thanksgiving and Christmas, you're colonized. You have to start, and with the Truth Telling Project, that, a fantastic endeavor, but the truth has to start with you. You have to begin to acknowledge that America has designed constructs to make you believe it's okay to oppress someone like me or David. And you, people can sit here all day and talk about all the great work they're doing. As long as systems of oppression are alive, you've failed. So when I see monuments, I look at them and I go, that's not for me. That's for someone who's white in America to feel as though they've contributed to some truth. Not contributing to my truth at all. Because I'm not, as Stokely Carmichael said, if you want to lynch me, that's your problem. If I let you lynch me, that's my problem. I completely respect this uh, point of view. And I just speaking about how actions are important because there is no reconciliation between if actions are not done. If you say sorry and then you're doing exactly the same thing, it's not a sorry. I just confirmed. But in the same time, I want to uh, so and refer to you to this spectrum of reconciliation, or spectrum of change. And because I do a lot of work on history, memory, and conflict, and identity, I do believe that uh, it's very important. What done in Alabama is extremely important. Because it's really create a part, a structure of this collective consciousness and collective memory redefinition of some ideas and awareness. We really have to understand there are still a lot of people who deny or do not want to accept it. So I think it's a very important statement as a part because what is monuments is really representation of the collective memory. And collective memory have a very strong normative function. I always tell, I always teach those who are in my, my classes, history is not about past. History is what about what? 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 Future, right? Because yeah. history is, has a strong normative function. Right. It's about what we should do about them. And it's very, very important to introduce more and more historic monuments like this and really make them very important part of the memory in together with all actions you are talking about which I never disagree, but I do believe that monuments are important. Okay, so you want to address this and then back here after. I'm Christy Jones, I'm a, a something like a doctor, second year doctoral student, I'm looking at Tehama who's on my committee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have two sentiments and this is, as many of the people in the room know me, I can, I come sometimes from an emotional place. As a scholar, I deeply respect what um, Professor Carasolina and Professor Simmons is talking about. Um, I deeply respect the analysis of the theory and, and, and talking about things. But as a black woman living in America, I'm done with small steps. Small steps don't save my life. Talking about insults don't keep a white man my size from bumping into me in the elevator when he's looking me dead in the face. This, and I'm not, and again, I'm trying to not come from this emotional place, but I definitely want to sort of co, <laughs> I want to co-sign kind of what David and Tony are saying. As a scholar, I get the need to have these discussions. I get the need to talk about monument and memorial and but it doesn't keep me alive. And I think what some people need to understand is that this is life and death for many of us. 
This is not a theory. This is not a practice. This is not a memorial. This is life and death. And even coming from the privileged position that I am, I am no inner city kid. I truly grew up with this, with the golden spoon in my mouth. But it's still life or death. And so what I often struggle with is, you know, we're talking about systematic humiliation in America, and I'm looking forward to reading the book, but I, I hope there's real parts in there about people's lived experiences, their everyday humiliations, the everyday experiences of you are not human, not just you're not American, you're not human, you don't matter. I don't care about you in the way people talk to you, the way they walk up to you, the way they address you. I'm 46 years old, there's nothing girl about me, but girl pushing you out of the way, not being able to say excuse me. These are lived experiences and the fact that I'm afraid <laughs> in my own home, in my own, because of these, of, of, especially with policing. And I, and I totally get on this deep sort of mental level what Tony is saying because there, th when do we get to stop? When do we get to be angry? When do we get to say enough? When do we get to stand up and say, this is some bullshit? Like, when do we get to say that? Because normally Americans have to be, African Americans have to be calm. Well, we're gonna talk about truth and we're gonna hold hands. No, I'm pissed. I'm done. So theory and, and study and all this is great, but what about the lived everyday heart, everyday heartbreak? Not once a week, once a year, one, everyday heartbreak that being black in America subjects you to. That's it. Thank you. Um, Fakura? <laughs> My name is Fakura, and I am a PhD student. Uh, and I will tap onto her voice, actually, and will say a little bit about how I see this, uh, this book being inserted in the field. What may it cause for us? Because to be in the field of conflict resolution, it means we are up to change the world, and we are up to take an actions and to say that something is wrong here, and we have to say something. My, I am a Palestinian lady, citizen of Israel. So this system of humiliation, I smell it, I taste it, I eat it, I see it each day. Palestinians eat it each day under the occupation. So we know what does that mean. But to bring it into this book, you gave it details. You said that it's beyond the word. It's in the skin of the people. It's like you cannot explain it. So you gave it details, oh, yeah. and you made it clear for us what that mean. And when you make it clear, so it's direct. We cannot avoid it as a field. We cannot avoid it any, any, anymore not to take action. As you said, if you are not dismantling the power so you are collaborating. So it's a question what this book will bring to the field and where it will take us as people who will make a difference, you know? So this is a question how you envision that because I was so identified with what you said. Yes, I am the oppressor. It gave me voice. This is my voice. I cannot not like it's, I ca you cannot any, any way avoid that it's systematic. It means there is agenda. It means that there is power, and it's clear in our face, you know? So the question, how, we, how you envision this with, it will make a difference for us as people in the field? Mm -hmm. And my question also, did you talk it just to America, just because well. it's a little bit safer space? <laughs> I mean, maybe. I mean, just That's our maybe next not. It's next just my let's do the book another one. Let's <laughs> do. Yeah, for me. We're going to do me. another I mean, one. Everybody, anyone. get ready. But definitely, <laughs> I want to thank each one of you because you gave me voice, because you detailed my, my life, and you enabled me to tap into that, to, uh, to take my voice like bigger and to determine that the world will take an action to change it, you know? Mm. But this very important resource for the field that we cannot anymore continue to have a small conversation about what's going on in the world in humiliation. And Thank when you. people are oppressed, Thank definitely. Thank you. I want to convey a, just a personal sentiment. You didn't know this, but um, 
when we met, I had the fortune of uh, me and my wife going to Israel and meeting Fekker, who hosted us, and hearing about the lives. And this, to me, was so moving. And I can't feel, I, you know, I'm basically a Jewish guy from northern New Jersey. So I don't, I don't know. But this is so moving. And, and it's, it speaks to the structures of a different kind of violence that I don't know anyone talking about. It's an existential violence that people go through in so many little ways. We need, we, we, the, the field needs to focus much more on this. And sorry, I still think that, you know, ideas mm -hmm. are important because ideas basically will either change the world or maintain oppressor, oppressive system. Um, and, but those ideas, I think, need to come from everyday, everyday life and practice. But, okay, sorry, I wasn't going to do that, but yes. Yes, sir. Namaste. I'm Kuldeep. Yeah. I'm from Nepal. I'm a second year PhD student at Christie. Uh, my question is to uh, Professor Karina Korostelina. Mm -hmm. I want to reflect on that uh, mural or monument uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, and in my hometown, there is a monument of, uh, of an indigenous leader. Uh, his monument is right in the middle of the town. And for, uh, for the indigenous people, they are called Tharu. Maybe he invokes a lot of uh, memories and his, uh, uh, his contributions to uh, get Tharu people's voice in the mainstream national debate on what a Nepali state should look like. But then I come from a privileged class from the same town. Uh, for me, that mural, uh, yeah, I, I should not feel ashamed to say that, but that mural or that monument doesn't invoke that much of memory in me or that much of sentiment, you know. So when Tony is saying that when you have the monument of, uh, like any mo monument, I, I'm not so familiar with the American history, so I shouldn't comment on that. But if, if that monument, as you are saying, that invokes a memory or, or a big motivation for a certain group of people, but doesn't invoke any kind of sentiment or emotion for other group of people in the same country, then what's the point? Like, how can we move beyond a monument being impactful for certain, only a certain group mm, of people, right. but then completely right. excludes the other group of people in the country? Like, where do you see that, that, um, that leap can be made, you know? The, maybe the question falls to both of you. And just so you know. You uh, can you use the mic, please? The, the, the mental illness of white supremacy, the, the cure isn't shame. You, 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 can't, you can't give an injection of shame in white supremacy and it changes, you see? So when you put up monuments, like, what about a monument of the people that were held accountable for those actions? Let, let's see some names, let's see some, let's, let's see some prison sentences. If, if systems of oppression like to live on punishment, then let's see some of that. That's the kind of monument that would make me go, wow. Because at the end of the day, when we look at the concept of justice, justice is a virtue, people. Don't you get it? This is why emotion's important. Justice is a virtue. It's the same virtue that you, can, that you take from with love. It's the same virtue that you take from with knowledge Compass and kindness. Too. Justice is supposed to be about wisdom. It is supposed to be about uh, mindfulness. It's supposed to be about morality. And so when you tie this criminal justice system together, that in itself is, is vile. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. um, it's a very good question. And exactly because then we speak about monument, it's very simplistic to tell, oh, monument is just a figure of the, which I pass by every day. It's not important what monument itself. What is important, what people do about this monument. How this particular right. monument right. challenge right. particular right. narratives how it destabilizes narrative for supremacy, how it destabilizes what events mm -hmm. are hold at this monument, how museum which is set near this monument or part of it, how children go there for their school activities. And it could be positive and negative. In a, in a, 
Croatia, uh, no, in, in Croatia, they have a monument to the uh, survival of the uh, war with, uh, uh, with uh, sorry, Croatians uh, and uh, tell me, Slova Serbs, Slova sorry, <laughs> Serbs. I was just thinking, sure. Serbs. So what they're doing, then bringing every single history teacher has to go to this concentration camp to experience it and then teach children how awful Serbs are. So you can do with monument good or you can do bad, but just because we don't have time, I can speak f forever about it. But what is important, not monument itself, it's what you are doing w about this monument. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I wanted to validate these um, calls to action here as a, just to engage it directly and say that I think the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution exists precisely to try to provide a consistent institutional setting to bring a, for a, to provide a platform for action. I think that's what we're here for. And so I want to say I really hear that call to action. And I think one of the things that's interesting to me about this panel, and one of the reasons why I introduced this kind of, you know, potentially distracting uh, multivalent thing, is because I think that action and analysis are not necessarily connected. In fact, I think they're almost, there's a relative autonomy. You can, t you can talk about action in one way, or you can, a you can analyze a problem and the action can be very different. And here's what I, what I worry about. And I think this speaks back to the problem about the BS of the, potentially BS of monuments. So what's the problem of being of an insult? That is the problem of, 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 of uh, the lack of dignity. The best, the solution that you would naturally apply is to, mo to memorialize. The solution is not reparations. The solution, but if we want reparations, I think that's actually a very interesting conversation. And maybe that's where we ought to go, but that's, but that's a question of economic injustice. And that's a question of industry. That's a question of uh, suburban flight. That's a question of that, I mean, so the, the, here's my point. You can analyze the, 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 the degradation and feel, and that can be the, na the nature of the problem, but the problem is if you stay there, then the solution is gonna be in the plane of respect. And I think that what, what I'm hearing is, is an analysis which is, look, there's this horrible situation that we can all recognize. And then the solutions don't necessarily fit with it. That is, they make sense in the, in the context, but the people who, need to hear why there needs to be, why, that, why reparations is in fact a reason. I, mean, I think that, I mean, look, let's just go back to the old book, Savage Inequalities in the School Systems. I mean, how can we sit like this again and again? I mean, this is my point. I don't see how, I'm completely with you that if you're not addressing, I remember I was at a, a high school, one of the best high school dropout conferences, this is another life, and we were all there, and this is a bunch of African-American um, principals were in the room, and we were talking about what to do about the, the high school dropout rate, especially on African-Americans. And everybody's talking about all sorts of things. And I raised my hand, and this is the nation's experts, and I said, what about the funding of the property tax mechanism? <laughs> Nobody wanted to talk about that. All the schools are fun wanted to talk about individual solutions, wanted to talk about racism, wanted to talk about all these things. That's cool, that's right. But you know what, the main thing we need to do is have it so that the, the value of the houses surrounding the school don't determine the outcomes of the kids in the school. That's my feeling. And that's a fundamental issue. Now, how do I get to that? Do I get to it? I mean, there's a number of ways, and for me, it's a political solution. And I need the 70% of the electorate who's white to somehow start to care. That's what I need. Yeah. And so that's, that's the nature of the, the kind of separation and trying to meet people at their pain. So for me, you have to meet people at their pain or they can't hear you, period. And there's a whole group of people who probably could have some potential to overcome the sickness of their white supremacy. And that's what I'm interested in. How do I engage that group of people who I think, some of them recognize the sickness of it and they want to get over it, and they certainly don't want their kids to be infected with it. But then I have to then say the, the, that I can't just link the solutions and the, that is the, 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 the action and the analysis. I have to somehow allow myself to be open about it. That's, that's, the, 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 that's the place I'm coming from. Okay, so we, one, can I say yes. one very important uh, thing what Solon was talking about. Um, Another great example, if you look in the state of California, 50% of tribes are recognized. 50% of tribes are not recognized. 
For 50% there are the monuments, there are land, there are claims and so on. For 50% no monuments erected, prohibited to do any, uh, like even go to the places of burials and do anything with that. If you look at the map of California, can you tell me where 50% no recognized tribes are? Can you imagine? Coastal area, where all these houses of many of those people who have these huge houses are, Calif are Hollywood people, are new tech people who consider themselves liberal. They will never give up their property to give opportunity for native tribe to claim their burial place. And until we have it, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. You can say apologies, you can build monuments, it will not change anything until this 50% of tribes, which were there on coastal uh, California, until this Hollywood type of people will call, who speaks on events for justice, will give up their properties. Then it will be justice. Mm. You, know, you know, one of the things is when we talk about problems in the communities or in communities, all of the answers come from places like this. And we wonder why they're in the same conditions. And so what I'm interested in is solutions coming from communities who are actually experiencing what we're talking about. And those communities are calling for reparations. And reparations doesn't necessarily look like all the time a check. You know, like the question is, how do we repair moral injury? Mm, yeah, right. And a report just came out from the Center for Investigative Journalism that showed how white folks are probably 10 times more likely to get a mortgage than black folks, which has led to the last two decades of gentrification using the Fair Housing Act. So when you ask me, how do we get to how do we heal moral injury or how do we deal with how do we reconcile you know it has to be like it has to deal specifically with the injury or how do we you know even if we look at debt collection ProPublica just came out with the report that says black folks particularly in Jennings Missouri which is right next to Ferguson was like the, one of the ground zeros where people who are black are more likely to be targeted with debt collection. So white people with the same debt don't even face the same consequences. So how do we look at our own, like, and, and not just that, like here's the thing. We live in a society where we are essentially drawn into complicity with injustice. If you're in this room, it's likely that you're wearing something that's fucking up somebody else somewhere else it's likely that your retirement account has something, you're, you're investing in some piece where there are weapons being, now that, because it's so overwhelming doesn't mean that there aren't possibilities. And what I've done was I've piece by piece unraveling myself from the complicity of this system. So if you are white, what is your role? It's to talk to white folks and fix your folks. Don't come in our communities telling us to fix our shit. And that's why I fuck with Arthur. Because he did what I asked him to do. And that's, that's what it looks like. That's what repair looks like. If we ask you to come in and do something, do that. Yeah. I think we need to figure out what we should do. What, what should we do? I want to leave this as a question. What should we do? And, and, and I am hearing, uh, first of all, this is the first time we got together to have a conversation, because email doesn't do it. Because email, usually you're polite. I try to be polite in email and, and not, not as controversial. We need controversial talk. We need basically to figure out what, what should we do. Um, so I am so grateful to so many people, to all of you for contributing to this event. And we got to figure out what do we do next? Um, I'm not sure, but 
um, thank you. And I really am so grateful to this great staff, Kwa and Ryan and Nora and others who <laughs> Ashley, <laughs> Ashley and Margarita and George Mason University. And so um, we can continue having conversation here um, for a while. So, yeah, so thank you very come, much. Come, please come on the September, on the May 7th. May 7th. The interview, because faculties who you see here and who you see there, they so, you speak and continue speaking about this. Topic. And we faculty have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a bad joke. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>